Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mets Trade Connect Tech Talk, the latest of a series. We're looking at the super yacht sector. My name is Martin Redmayne, and we're talking today about the green engine room. Rather than talk about the whole engine room, which is obviously a very big topic, we're focusing on uh, auxiliary power and the genset world. So I'm joined today by a very esteemed panel, uh, Eva Veldhaus from Mayfair Marine, uh, Jan van Vissers from Belvoir Penta, and the two gentlemen from Vol um, MTU Rolls-Royce, Tobias Cole and Dr. Peter Rigger. Good day to you, gentlemen. How are you? We're good. Thank I'm you fine. Thank you. Thanks for having us. I'm fine. So listen, Evo, very quick question. Um, let's talk about auxiliary power. Uh, low load, uh, un, sort of stable loading, and also the, the issue of shore connections and stuff. What is your current perspective on what we do well and what we don't do well in the, uh, the world of gensets? Um, Various things we we do well. Obviously, we um, <clears throat> the 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 super yacht industry does quite well with making sure that electricity is always provided on board super yachts, um, and and that is that's something that we have done quite well. But as a side consequence, obviously, generators tend to be um, over over provide over capacity are generally too big, not running on their ideal loading and so forth. So they create um, additional amount of smoke and so forth and um, so generally not not the most efficient um, but secure but generally not the most efficient way um, so that is one of the aspects the other aspect is is obviously that gen particularly on the larger yachts um, uh, say a 100 meter or a 90 meter yacht generally the shore side capacity for shore power is um, essentially very limited um, so generally, the big yachts tend to run on generators pretty much most of their life, um, certainly involved in the project that I'm currently doing. Um, and hence, we are emitting emissions very close to the shore or, if not, in the marina all the time. Yes. And you see that marinas are going to have an issue with this and coastal communities are going to have an issue with this. So this is one of the things that... Um, uh, yeah, that drives our uh, our industry, and we need to find solutions for that. So, from your experience, um, let's say, what what are the solutions you want to see come into the market? Well, um, obviously, um, uh, one of the things that, that we are very keen on is is obviously some sort of uh, uh, zero emission uh, if, if uh, and if not battery solution for for the uh, for when the yard. Uh, or in the marina, um, and this can be achieved in, in many, many different ways. Um, uh, obviously, as you know, I am very much a big fan of, of hydrogen and fuel cells, but that's, that is one of the many solutions that um, can be done. I think um, it requires a partnership um, uh, approach involving the marinas, involving fuel suppliers, involving um, shore site uh, electricity providers um, and combining all of that together we can provide uh, an ideal solution to make sure that the yachts are quiet and do not um, uh, emit uh, emissions. Um, one of these ideal solutions is the, the, the introduction of power barges where we use the storage of, of, of hydrogen gas uh, together with containerized versions of fuel cells and we're using those as uh, a way to increase the shore side power loading of, of, of the vessels. Cool. Um, so that, yeah, that these big yachts can, can actually get the power they need and yeah. can turn off their generators. Yeah, I think it's going to become a bigger problem than we realize in the long term as more and more boats come on stream and marinas aren't ready for it. Uh, so, so Jan yeah. Willem, uh, tell me about Volvo Penta's approach to this topic or this problem, because it's, it's something the, gen the gener generator manufacturers find frustrating these low loads and these high emissions um what's the solution? yeah exactly yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's not uh, not only for us but also for the customer it should be yeah, an so. issue because uh it's uh, you create more maintenance costs you have uh, other stuff which is uh, can be avoided and especially now uh, entering the area of imo3 which will come up in come in place the first of january uh, let's say low loads is uh, a no-go area because then we might uh, uh, have a, an installation which doesn't work properly. It could be clogged. Uh, I think uh, the chief engineer on board did, doesn't like that. He would like to have a, a, a steady uh, power solution. 
so as, as said by Ivo, uh, it's all about, let's say, making a correct selection of uh, uh, engines so we have a proper load. And this could be achieved by, uh, let's say, as we call the power of plenty. So we have a multiple installation, not too big engines. On the other hand, you can also do that by going variable speed, for instance. So if you have a low load, uh, you just reduce the RPM of the of the genset. Uh, you could do that uh, by DC generation, DC generation, or an AC generator on several uh, RPMs. So um, by that, you keep the load on the engine uh, relatively high, and also the exhaust temperature, and you will have no issue on. Uh, on the after treatment and you have a better fuel efficiency because uh, when you compare for instance I did some comparison on our engines on variable speed and fixed speed and then you see that on variable speed you can gain uh, minimum 10% on fuel efficiency when you are below 50% load of the generator so uh, all in all yes uh, making a good balance uh, uh, electric balance of the vessel and uh, act like that and just not put two big engines in or make them variable speed. So at least uh, you have uh, an optimum uh, installation on board with less maintenance, less uh, risk on uh, clogging systems. Uh, yeah, and, and we as a supplier, we have a solution for that, but yeah, uh, <laughs> many others have that as well. So uh, does this answer your question slightly? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think what, what's interesting, I'm going to come to uh, Peter and, and Tobias. Peter, listen, put it from into, into context now. Um, we're building yachts today that will be built for, and, and delivered next year, the year after, and probably 2025 in some cases. What are we doing now that is, is sort of solving this problem? Are we moving fast enough or could we move faster in this technology approach? Yeah, first of all, thanks for, for Ivo and Jan Willem. They, they draw a little bit the playground where, where we're playing. So a lot of the topics already have been mentioned. Already as of today, with uh, our MTU hybrid solutions from Rolls-Royce Power Systems, we are able to provide our customer with systems where, for example, you can use the battery also in the harbor to uh, substitute the genset or to help the genset or to help the shore connection. So if you want to get rid of running gensets at low load, you can use a battery, perhaps in combination with a, with a weak shore connection in, in order to lower the peaks. So that's what we are doing today. Are we fast enough? Good question, perhaps not. But uh, next topic to come, we heard a little bit about fuel cells. Also me, I am a big fan of fuel cells. So I'm personally convinced that with all the infrastructure growing with uh, traffic on highway uh, to the harbors, so there will be infrastructure for hydrogen and this in a mid and long-term future will be exactly the right thing to get rid of emissions in the harbors by gensets. Yeah, on that topic, what do you think the barriers are, apart from the obvious, I say, infrastructure issues, is the market ready for fuel cell? If I may, um, uh, is that to, to a certain extent, the technology is, is, is certainly ready. If you look at some of the well-known fuel cell manufacturers like, like PowerCell and Ballard and, and those kind of companies, um, then, um, and Plug Power, for instance, those are, those are certainly ready to enter the marine market. Um, and yet they have marine ready solutions. One of the things that uh, is unfortunately not ready are the regulations and the regulatory infrastructure. So companies like Lloyd's and, and, and to a lesser extent DNV are not really, um, how shall I put it, comfortable with the topic to sign it off because there are no official uh, rules and regulations for hydrogen. And, um, and there are more what we call guidelines for, uh, for fuel cell installation. So that is one aspect of it and obviously um, there's always the case of, okay, I need to supply the hydrogen to the yacht. And obviously um, hydrogen um, is not produced, particularly in Europe, uh, is not produced in many locations. Most of those locations are either in Rotterdam or Germany or the north of France, so industrial areas. So getting the hydrogen 
to in large quantities, that is, to, to the areas where the yachts are, is uh, generally you will end up with using a road tanker to drive it to the marina, essentially. And then obviously, then comes the whole process of transferring the hydrogen into the yacht. Um, uh, and even that is a pretty complicated process uh, with various safety issues that need to be considered. So is it straightforward? Um, no, not, not entirely. Is it doable? Yes, it is. But sure. I see the regulations and upgrading the training of the crew mainly as the key elements, really. But what do you say there's a timeline of, let's say, 10 years or, or less until this becomes part of our ecosystem? <clears throat> Um, if I look at the commercial marine world where we do, where Mayfair Marine does a lot of work, um, we see the speed is very quick um, and there's a lot of but mainly liquid hydrogen projects coming on stream, ferries, uh, um, uh, ammonia, for instance, is another alternative hydrogen carrier that's, that's obviously a lot, uh, uh, receiving a lot of attention. Yeah. Um, and uh, those, those projects... Um, uh, are moving very fast. So you'll see that happening in the next five to eight, 10 years. So the 10 year time span. Yachting is different. Um, uh, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen. I would love to do a hydrogen yacht. Um, and I know there are some ideas and, and active projects even, but um, they are all hitting that regulation barrier, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, uh, even with the classification societies and also the flag states who are like, well, this is all new technology. We are changing the world. And then we're talking about the designers who are not used to incorporating these big volumes. There are design issues. So it, it is a, um, yeah, it's a complicated topic that requires this, this partnership approach. Everybody needs to come together and understand that uh, hydrogen and alternative fuels are different, but I'm, di I'm diverging a bit too much from the topic, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so Peter, please. Yeah, Ivo, I, t I tend to agree. So all, all the points you're mentioning are, are the right ones, but I think also, and that's that's the way uh, where we are uh, going to with our MTU solutions is this market, we have to shape it. And I'm completely convinced that also for the yacht market, especially for the power generation, onboard power generation, we will see solutions much earlier than within a decade's time. So if you look on, on the money that uh, within the European Union will be spent on this hydrogen topic within the next decade, so we're talking about 450 mi uh, billion euros, yes, um, it, it, it would be completely fool to ignore that on a, for the super yachts. This will happen. And, and we have the opportunity now to shape it. I think maybe just to, for the other engine uh, companies in the in the in the call, I do like to would like to mention that obviously there are various uh, um, engines, uh, internal combustion engines that can be converted to hydrogen yes. and alternative fuels, and there is a lot of those around. So certainly the whole hydrogen topic is not just about fuel cells; it is also involves internal combustion engines. <laughs> Worth yeah, mentioning. Exactly. Yes, yeah. thank you, uh, Ivo, <laughs> because <laughs> we did already a conversion. And, and okay. if I may something else about this topic, which hopefully is uh, useful, um, what we notice in in the yachting is that comfort is a, is an issue is an issue. Uh, with fuel cells, you need a battery pack, uh, and if you want to run, uh, let's say, uh, uh, without any gensets, you need also a big battery pack. So what I expect. Hello. Yep. <laughs> My screen is dark. All of a sudden, what happened? You're still there. Sorry. Ah, no. yeah, I'm still here. Yes, uh, and you can hear me still. Okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, um, so what will happen in my uh, what I think will be the future is that we will shoot we should build up power plants on board vessels built on small stones uh, small packages which can be easily changed up to uh, a fuel cell or whatever will be there in the future I think uh, I fully agree with Ivo that uh, hydrogen is one of the future fuels but the, there are still some let's say some hurdles to take uh, in storage uh, and the amount of uh, hydrogen to take on board. Uh, regulation is not ready yet, but if we build up a power plant on board based on, let's say, uh, three, four, five uh, gen sets today, IMO3 may be based uh, or should be based IMO3, and then they can easily be changed uh, in 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 the near future by more uh, uh, 
cleaner uh, CO2 neutral uh, solutions because it's just a matter how you produce the power and there are several solutions. We also have, as uh, Ivo said, we have also, we are experimenting now with uh, uh, combustion engines uh, with dual, on dual fuel, which is also showing uh, a good result, but it's too early to, uh, to release this to the market. And this is not a Volvo solution. I would like to clearly say it's a solution jointly developed with a commercial operator. Um, so, um, yeah, my, my advice to the market would be build it up in small blocks and, uh, and prepare for the future, but the future is not, uh, there, there yet, but it will come within 10, year, 10 years. That's uh, for sure. And you mentioned two, two very important points. I would say, I think one is, uh, I will pick up the, um, thing with intelligence. So how to make a, a good sizing of the generators and, uh, uh, I very much like also the idea to think about this this brick or the component exchange idea because we have for, on the one side new builds. Hello. Can you hear me quite well? I can hear you. Yes, perfectly. we can. Yeah. yeah. So I will continue. So we have the new builds on the one side, which is a good thing because there we have more flexibility, but we have have many many existing yards, and uh, there uh, we we uh, need to find ways uh, to really identify the real load profile of, of the generators. One, one thing was mentioned before to replace, we have at the most time two or three jennies on board to replace one with a battery pack and run, run the engines more efficient. That's the one thing. Um, the other thing is um, if, if we have the knowledge how the, the boats have been operated, we um, um, have the possibility to make the correct dimensioning for any energy source. It doesn't matter if it's the battery pack in the end or if it's, it's, it's a fuel cell or also reformer technology. I also want to touch that one. Uh, so alternative fuels here um, or, or these kind of, of, of technologies. Um, infrastructure is a very important thing. Um, I very much agree also to what, what Peter said. We need to, to drive that so nobody will, will wait for us. So we have the possibility to push this forward and create somehow the demand in, in, in this direction and also help the marinas um, with, with um, let's say knowledge and also uh, ideas how to um, yeah, make that infrastructure possible. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think that's a key factor actually, Tobias, is, is that when you look at the marketplace and the amount of yachts that are sitting in marinas and using that infrastructure on a day-to-day -day basis, um, we've been fairly slow to adapt uh, and change our position in the market to put the right amount of power for the fleet growth. So um, is there a better solution in terms of that shore-based infrastructure? So if I might uh, give an opinion here, we uh, have in our MTU solution portfolio, a lot of stationary power generation and we yeah. have a very close look on everything we call power to X alternative fuels on-site power generation and transformation. Uh, that's why I'm so convinced that infrastructure will happen because we, we take part and we drive this, but especially for stabilizing shore power, uh, for example, with fuel cells, with stationary battery container, battery packs, uh, we solve a part of the problems which uh, are there today. So the weak connection onshore uh, is today a problem in some harbors. Um, infrastructure of hydrogen with, with surplus of energy from local um, local generated sun or wind power. So what we will see within the next decade will have all or a lot of those elements, not every element in every harbor, but we will see a combination. And that, that makes a little bit the complexity. And, and as Ivo rightly mentioned, um, all the regulatory stuff uh, hinks a little bit behind. And that's so, so we, we need to, to tackle the challenge on, on different playgrounds, regulatory one, technology one, economical one, uh, obviously. And uh, I think that's, that's where uh, those European programs help also the industry to team up. But mm. it will happen and we have it in our hands to shape it. Yeah, yeah and I then... think I would like one part of it. No, I was going to mention that, that the key word here is the word partnership. And I think um, because we are all, um, the, the, the people in our call represent only a certain set of components within the overall energy system. And um, so when and the reason why I mentioned partnership is because you need to come up with um, both users and creators of shore power to, to come up with a solution. 
So in this discussion, you should also drag in the, uh, perhaps with kicking feet, but you have to drag in the marina, the marinas. Yes. And they are really key to this solution and they also need to be part of this discussion in the future. Well, I think even on that point, you're almost going to see that the marinas will have regulations imposed upon them in the future to reduce I pollution. Think so, yes. it's, it's coming yeah. already, it's coming already. And I feel that's where mm. the partnerships have to start now with all stakeholders and say, listen, we shouldn't be sitting in port running 10% of the generator load just to keep air conditioning running or to keep <laughs> lights on a boat. It just doesn't make any sense. No. Um, so yeah. there's, there's, there's almost three, three elements here. One is the, the infrastructure on land um, to adapt and improve and invest in partnership with the industry. Uh, there's also the, the, the design engineering and yacht builders to stop even building yachts with so much almost unnecessary load requirements. Can we re-engineer <laughs> to have less requirement in a port situation? It sometimes doesn't make any sense to me that 300 days a year, there's no guests on board, yet the, 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 the system's running all the time. So is there a better way of running the asset with a, with a better infrastructure on land, but also a better system on board to actually stop this thought process of continuous running for the sake of the crew? No offense to crew, sorry. <laughs> I, I think the, the, one of the things that I, I wanted to add, Martin, is that um, coming to the yacht builder for, for a minute is that um, um, to a certain extent, our industry is very innovative on one side. Uh, we look at AV and all the, the consumer experience on board the yacht. And on the other side, our industry is enormously backward. <laughs> Where, uh, and um, so, you know, I, I don't represent the builder, so I can be a bit open <laughs> about this topic, is that, um, uh, is that when it comes to the propulsion of the vessel itself, um, we are still sticking to the old and trusted method. And, and yes, I can understand why shipyards do that. They are obviously tied to very uh, risky projects and risky uh, contracts and so forth, and their financial penalties are high. So again, in the, in the spirit of partnership, is that we should try to remove some of those barriers in our industry to allow innovation also on the yacht from the yacht building side yes. um, to, to happen, um, to move away from the typical combustion engine drivetrain setup. And, to, and that applies, obviously, most of the bigger yachts are all diesel electric now, and, and they, have, they are future proof. But when I look at the typical 50, 35 meter, maybe even 65 meter yachts, they, they, till, they still tend to be using the conventional setup. And I think it is those yachts and also what Tobias mentioned, the refit. Wow, there's a lot of opportunity around to really improve the market, but it is um, also about us as a yachting industry to say, look, it is possible and we have all these solutions available. Please listen to us to, uh, to introduce hybrid drivetrains, to, to combine fuel cells with batteries, to to do all these wonderful things that we can do to improve the efficiency of the yachting, of the, of the yacht itself. Yeah, to, and, to me, and that's what can be done now. To me, to me, Ivo, exactly that. There is an opportunity for the industry, I suppose the word is clean up its act, by yes. re-engineering and rethinking the way in which yachts are operated, but not just at a new build phase, in the upgrade or rebuild phase, because uh, as mm -hmm. you're saying, Tobias, there's, there's, there's 4,000 yachts out there that have got very conventional, old school technology that could be very easily adapted for the future. And to me, that's almost a responsibility of the market to sort of put forward to the owner an opportunity. Because mm -hmm. I think that's another factor. We need to make sure the fleet starts to reinvent itself for a next generation thought process. Absolutely. I think what we can do as the industry is really deliver confidence also to, to the shipyards because Ivo, um, you're right on, on, on somehow on a certain point, the industry is, is conservative. On the other side, if I reflect the last, I would say three, four years, not five, three, four years, something like that. There's such a major change, change uh, going on. And uh, we are very much in discussions with all of, of, of the big shipyards regarding uh, possibilities how to make um, conventional systems on the one side more efficient, but also to replace step by step 
as I mentioned, uh, generated by another device. And also hybrid is, is a thing because if, if we um, think about a second, the big mega yacht is entering into a harbor and, a gener and the, the propulsion engines are running on idle. And even there, the gearbox has to, to slip somehow because the power is too much. Yes. And we do not need to talk about low load and SCR systems at this moment. I don't <laughs> have to explain what this means, but their hybrid can help us as well. And yeah. uh, these things are available for sure. They are not, let's say, available in the way that we say we have experience for, for the last 20 years. That's, that's not a point. On the other side, uh, it's technology which is there. Technology which has, has been uh, used in other applications as, as well, and we can easily transfer it uh, to, to solutions on mega yards. Yeah. Uh, Jan Willem, what are the shipyards saying to you about the future? Um, as I said before, but I lost connection for some reason, uh, so I, I, I lost part of the conversation. Uh, comfort is uh, high in, in, the, in the level, so they, they, I, I expect uh, a move towards uh, uh, batteries, uh, more batteries, hybrid solutions, so they can sail uh, zero emission in harbors, but also be in a, in a bay somewhere. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you need to think, you need to rethink the whole design of the vessel, of course. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, maybe you move away from complete conventional drivetrains and you, you start with diesel electric uh, as a, a, because it's just a part of the whole power, power plant. So yes, there will be uh, uh, a change, uh, especially to comfort. And, and I think the interest for uh, emissions and let's say having a, a lower footprint, uh, environmental footprint, that's also coming up in the super yacht industry and uh, gains uh, momentum at, the, at this moment. And we need to, to shift on that as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even, even the public is watching uh, to this industry quite, quite more. And also the, let's say, uh, owners are looking um, in, uh, yeah, in this direction more and, and have an eye to make, make their hobby, let's say, yeah. a little bit more green. That's mind changing it's there, I guess. Exactly. I, I think there's a definite perception issue we have to tackle, but also one of the things that's come up in conversation before is, is the resistance to change from people like chief engineers and people on board the yachts who are not necessarily <laughs> ready for the change because they're, they're fairly old school <laughs> in their mentality. Is that fair? Um, in my experience, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Peter, so, Peter, your comment? Yeah, it's, uh, meets also <laughs> our experience. So um, we, we made a lot of experience with uh, with our uh, hybrid solutions. So in principle, even if you can make an economical case and then show that the benefits for operators and so on and so on, it is about introducing something new into the machine room and... Um, yeah, the openness for this is, let me say, limited. Yeah. I, th I think the first revolution was already introducing electronics on an engine for them. And now <laughs> we are doing one step forward, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, introducing more components, more electricity, more power management systems. So uh, yes, that will be challenging. And maybe also uh, a need for a different type of engineers on board. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, again, I think we have to, to make it as, as easy as possible. For sure, this will be new technology and everything which is new is somehow difficult in the first step. But we have many, many more possibilities in comparison to the past. Let's, let's think about digital solutions, connecting to the boat, having remote services, all these kind of stuff can help us here to, to make that, that yep. happen. Do you think there will ever be a time when <clears throat> the engine manufacturer um, is such a partner that they provide a yacht with an engineer on board full time, a bit like I'm, I'm thinking more like aviation, the, the relation between the engine manufacturer and the plane. Do you think that will ever become part of our future in terms of maintenance, efficiency, supply, and operation? I think we have very much parallel, uh, parallels to to the air, air industry, and uh, somehow there are, let's say. Uh, ideas and um, solutions we we can can look for and also yeah. combine with with uh, with with uh, mega yachts. I mean, as the customers are the same in the end, um, it totally makes sense to go in this direction. And I see definitely possibilities to not copy but further develop existing solutions from the air industry. Yeah, I'm thinking about the, the way Rolls Royce work with jet manufacturers is is a very different scenario, but certainly has application and probably some operational benefits in terms of financial control um, to make sure the maintenance profile becomes a much more attractive proposition. Absolutely. 
um, I think Martin, I'd just like to add that for the uh, fuel cell industry, um, this is definitely one of the things that they are looking at where um, when you look at a multi-meg or at the three or five megawatt installation, for instance, it comes in modular blocks um, and those blocks, one of those blocks can be replaced while the other units remain uh, uh, remain active and providing power to the vessel. Um, and these blocks can be rented on a power by hour basis, which is very much where the, 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 the link to the aviation industry is coming from. Um, and so actually, I think it is a good idea because particularly with the hydrogen technology, this is very complicated technology uh, that is different. Uh, so don't expect the chief engineer on a, an 80 meter yacht to understand how this all works. You need a dedicated hydrogen person who, who understands how the, how the components and how the system works and to make sure that the hydrogen comes on board safely. Um, so having somebody from the company as part of the actual crew is actually not a bad idea. I do think that's a very good suggestion. Yeah, Peter, please. I'm, I'm, I don't fully agree with uh, Ivo what, what you said here. So the technology, oh, good. Itself, <laughs> the technology itself, when the maturity and the, the field experience is there, mm. is much simpler if you look quite objective on it from a from a red set engine and and uh, the fuel system to uh, fuel cell and the hydrogen system or at least mm -hmm. it's not much more complex but i agree uh, mm -hmm. so with with the different kind of business model so renting the modules renting or or, or, or selling the power or the propulsion mm -hmm. uh, by kilometer by power and so on and so on so there will be a significant change and I think uh, the modularity you mentioned is a key for that. Yeah, well, it, it's mainly because also fuel cells tend to have a lifetime uh, requirement. They vary between 25 to 30,000 hours essentially, and then the stack has to be taken apart and built back together again. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the concept of modularity has really been introduced in these megawatt installations. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, is something that you can, what, for instance, uh, you know, Willem was saying about having more engines and having more modular units inside the engine room would allow for this, this flexibility. And I think one of the things that, that would be worth mentioning, Martin, is the concept of future proofing. Because obviously, if you're building a yacht now and you know that the scene of technology is changing within the next decade, what are we supposed to say to owners to, to now make this large investment into the yacht and then say, well, you need to go and change it all in five to eight years. And that yeah. is, I think, is something that we as, a, as an industry should think about, you know, it's, uh, um, because we get this question regularly, <laughs> basically, and it stops them from committing to a new yacht. Because they're like, well, I'll wait a little bit. I'll rent a couple of, or I'll charter a couple of yachts for a couple of seasons. I'm not going to buy that yacht now because I know that the technology is changing. Yeah. Uh, and we, we, we get this a lot, actually, which is a shame because it, it's, it, yeah, it stops, the, it stops the introduction of the new technology and it stops the introduction of these visionary owners that we always talk about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tobias, do, do you think the market is, I say, open, getting more open to this transition into the next generation of um, the propulsion power systems, etc. Where every, every conversation you have with a shipyard, is it getting easier to talk about hybrid and new generation systems or is there still a barrier that you're wanting to overcome? Yeah, so um, I would say over the last couple of years, this change is definitely significant. So um, we have, I would say, not, not one single meeting with the shipyards where we not have a discussion, even if it's not a side discussion regarding uh, alternative technologies or things we can do to make to make the boat more green. So that's that's definitely happened. I think what, what still remains a challenge is uh, to, to um, yeah, make it then to a project, to a real order. Um, so at the moment, um, I have the feeling it's still, still a special thing. Um, but again, as... Yeah, ref reflecting all the discussions we have and also the direction the, the situation is driving to, I am absolutely confident 
that we will get more and more orders uh, with with hybrid installations, but and with alternative solutions. Uh, um, hydrogen is, I would say, also on every second meeting a topic. So the shipyards are open for that definitely. And as as I mentioned before, I think we, we as an industry have to deliver deliver some of the confidence that that we can make it. Yeah, one of the things that's come up in conversation with me with shipyards and other intermediaries is the cost of these new systems. What is the what is the percentage difference on the capex? Roughly, I think that's a close guarded secret, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the size of the boat. I must admit, there is a, a, a there is a, a size issue. If, if yeah. the boat is big, you know, 100 meters or whatever, the relative cost of the power plant is smaller uh, compared to the overall figure. If the boat becomes smaller, let's say a 50 meter or a 35 meter, then all of a sudden the electricity budget goes through the roof, and um, and that is obviously not something. Yeah, that affects the the the, the um, the overall balance and that has an effect on price of the yacht. Yes. So in the smaller boat sector, smaller, you know, defined small, but <laughs> you know what I mean? In, in, in the 35 to 50 meter market, even 60 meter market, I think it has an effect. Uh, higher up, 150, whatever, uh, 120 to 150 meters, I think it's not the it's not the defining factor. Those boats are diesel electric already. So, yeah, sure, sure. so uh, but, but it's the, the 35 to 60 meter range, I think. So any comment my, in the, my experience with talking to shipping? Any comment for the engine companies? Price variation? Any any percentages or ballpark figures? Uh, if you, if you look at the standard package we have for a genset, and you we need to adjust it now to IMO three, it's a plus uh, roughly twenty thousand euro per, per genset. So relatively, that's uh, uh, quite a good package. Um, and that's is from let's say 200 kilowatt up to 500 kilowatt uh, electric what we can supply. Yep. Um, so and uh, another issue which is let's say a kind of dark cloud uh, uh, in many aspects by by the market is that they think that the installations are very big and huge, uh, consuming a lot of space. Uh, and then I, I would like to say to everybody listening to this uh, call, uh, check uh, the uh, the market very well, because there are also very compact installations available, which can be uh, installed in a corner of your uh, machine room, engine room. So you can hardly find it, the, the after treatment system from uh, a certain supplier sitting on the desk here. <laughs> <laughs> well, is any comments advertising on MTU? <laughs> Peter, or Tobias, any, any comment on the, the, the price point or the, the, the value proposition? Yeah, definitely. So um, what I have to mention here is that um, the most challenging thing is that we have to compare apples with apples. So um, a system, let's say a modern system, let's stay a second with a hybrid system, for example, it is not, let's say, the traditional gearbox engine combination and the generator with the traditional switchboard, which is much more integrated. So we always talk about a complete integrated system where we have also control over the, uh, on, on, from the bridge, let's say, to the engine room. And uh, take over also the, uh, uh, let's, uh, the, 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 the power management system and uh, some, let's say, Lego bricks in this, in this game, which have not been part of, of the scope before. So from this perspective, um, it is somehow in the first step expensive. It seems to be expensive, but if you, in the end, if you calculate everything together, um, it is somehow affordable and attractive. And um, there again, this is something where, where, where we have really compared the right things and uh, uh, let's say comparable scopes. I think this is the point. I think, I think the market has to do much more homework. Uh, like like uh, Jan Willem was saying, to, to do the investigation thoroughly to get the right result. Because obviously there's two things, is one is the, the understanding of what you're buying, but also the life cycle cost. And that becomes even more interesting because I feel the market doesn't, it's starting to look at life cycle cost, but not in the way that shipping has done or aviation has done in a, in a sophisticated calculation. To me, that's missing. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot more money can be saved over time if you apply the right system. Absolutely. I think yeah. yeah, go ahead, Peter. No, go yeah. ahead, Peter. Absolutely, and we, we, we had a little bit of discussion about new business models and so, and so on, and, and when we're talking about hydrogen and fuel cells, about infrastructure, 
which is a little bit like Tobias and also Ivo already mentioned, it's, it's about looking a little bit more holistic on, on the whole energy system of the yacht yes. and not comparing uh, perhaps a today's genset installation with a, don't know what, tomorrow's fuel cell generator installation. This would not work directly. On long term, most likely yes, but not directly. And so this is the process where we, we are, as, as the whole industry, in uh, to, to guide and lead this process. Mm -hmm. Eva, any comments? Yeah. Well, no, I just wanted to mention that, that you mentioned the word life cycle cost, which I think is um, uh, something also that, that uh, when we advise clients um, from our side of the, the, the table, so to speak, um, it's probably not a topic that is mentioned a lot. You know, we, we tend to uh, advise a client to, um, to, 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 to build a certain yacht with a certain builder, to look at what do you want to do with the yacht, how many people do you want to take, what is your range, et cetera, et cetera. But we don't want to say, well, how much money do you want to spend over a 20-year period? Uh, look at crew, crew operational costs. Let's look at, you know, all those kind of things. And um, uh, so then all of a sudden the operational efficiency of the yacht in performing its function, as in you know, providing the owner with its it, with its uh, uh, its pleasure, is is certainly something that should be considered. So I think one of the things how you how we do the how we do this in uh, uh, in the European projects that I'm involved with is we, we we use this concept of digital twin, which essentially is a digital version of the boat. Um, and I think probably, you know, MTU and, and, and all the pens are very familiar with the concept is that um, uh, that way we can actually do a proper life cycle analysis of the yacht. Um, and um, in which you can use data from previous, uh, from previous yachts and you look at, you know, how do charters operate and how much kilometers do they do and what is their consumption and power consumption on board, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you put all of that into a digital model and then you actually calculate the life cycle cost and the, the emissions of the yacht and you know, all, the, it's all the things that you would normally do with a yacht. Yeah. And I think that is something that we, um, certainly from the, 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 the companies, um, generally talking to the yacht brokerage companies in, in the industry, um, can certainly introduce the whole concept of digital twins to advise clients better. Basically. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think it comes down to, um, there's, there's a factor here which comes into a lot of conversations is, is how much advice the end client gets and at what yeah. time in the conversation, because I think if they knew more about what is available or what they could do to improve or optimize the vessel, they'd rather mm -hmm. invest in that uh, from yeah. a future thinking point of view. And it comes down to how I'll just ask a very simple question here. How often do members of the MTU team or the Volvo Penta team actually ever talk to the end user? Does that ever happen? <laughs> On both shows sometimes, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm, I'm intrigued as to whether they actually ever want to know or ever inquire about what is, is there a better solution? Or is there always these barriers or gatekeepers that stop that information getting through to them? I think uh, some of the final operators or customers uh, or clients, they are really interested and they are uh, up to all minor detail in, involved and other ones that they don't care at all. They would just want to have their vessel. Uh, so uh, it depends really uh, uh, customer by customer. But I think the interest will grow because, uh, and also from the crew, uh, due to the IMO3 and all the new installations, there is there should be become more interest in this because we cannot bypass it. It will be there, and the new technology is will will get will become will come in, and uh, and also I think the uh, the market will will look at super yachts as uh, big spenders, and if the, it's not green, and maybe the cities will block them to to get into the harbors. Uh, they can only sail in zero emission or whatever. So the, this new technology will come in. So the interest of the customer should grow. And also he should realize, or she, of course, uh, should realize uh, that uh, the impact, uh, also the, uh, you know, how do you call it, social impact of his uh, investment yes. and how they look at him uh, is also uh, uh, becoming a, a big issue or a big point in the future, I think. Yeah, yeah. 
Tobias. Absolutely, absolutely. I think there is there is nothing to add. Uh, that's exactly the, the same answer I would have given. We have totally different uh, um, owners. Some are very interested, as you said. Some um, are, let's say, represented through the the management uh, companies. Then, yeah. But it's changing, changing. As I said, the public is is having a view, and uh, yeah. I see. I think we will have in, in future more direct discussions here, also regarding the life cycle cost issue and the green footprint overall. Yeah, yeah. Any final comment from you, your side? Again, I have one last question for all four of you. All right, and it's really just as a blue sky, a blue sky thought. If you look beyond the ten years, beyond twenty thirty, uh, and you look in terms of today's industry. 5,000 plus yachts and, and between now and 2030, another couple of thousand yachts potentially. What are the things that you feel we today should do to make sure um, the technology we apply, the people we employ becomes what I call the number one priority or focus? Is the one thing that we should do as an industry to say, right, we have to do this, we have to change this. Um, because it, otherwise it's going to mean that the future isn't going to be as healthy as we feel. Tobias, you go first, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I would say that the most important thing we, we can do is not, not stop talking about this, uh, okay. um, having this discussion continuously, and also, let's say, um, have a look to, to the overall situation. So um, we, we mentioned already, it, it, it's not the own reality or the, not the own solution. It'd be a mixture of different technologies and we need to uh, align ourselves continuously and uh, have discussions like this to further drive that. And, and then I'm convinced that we have this decarbonization approach, as we say, uh, yeah, quite soon in 2030 there. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm gonna... Yeah, I, I think uh, the crew plays also a, a, a quite an important role here and uh, to convince them that uh, an installation fit for purpose and not just overdimensioned is much better for them also in lower maintenance uh, and, and, and works. Uh, that would be, uh, I think, also one of the keys. Uh, it's it's a world on its own, uh, and yeah. they are quite conservative, I think. So if we and the uh, captains are most of the time advising the owners, so they play a very important role here. Um, what I would 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 suggest is, and I said it before, build up your power plant in a modular way, because only uh, complying uh, to IMO three is not future proof. It's future today. Uh, it's proof for today, or uh, but not for the future. And build it up in a modular way so you can easily change. So your your investment in your super yacht uh, is still valid in ten years, and you can upgrade it again in a very simple way. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Peter. Uh, so I think. Um... Adding on, on what has been said from Jan Willem and, and Tobias already, that the sustainability of a solution will become more and more important. The, the customer, the user, the operator, the user of a yacht, the one who buys and orders the yacht, uh, will have a more closer look on the CO2 footprint, uh, all that stuff, perhaps not from his own heart, but... Um, the public discussion around and the look from the society on yacht users will force the industry and the users to go for sustainable solutions. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And Eva? Oh, there is some very good things have been said already. Um, I, I think I'd like to, to finish with, with um, uh, the fact that um, we, we, need to work, we need to move to a sort of zero carbon solution in, in, in the future. And um, uh, one of the things that that implies is essentially moving away from, from our current fuels, uh, that being the diesel, um, and how, whichever, whichever with whatever topic we are going to replace that with, or whatever fuel could be hydrogen, ammonia, batteries. I mean, there's many different solutions. So I think the Fuel supply industry, fuel supply infrastructure for these alternative fuels. Uh, and we talked about shore power. See that as a fuel, really, um, is is really uh, uh, the key, I think. Because if there's no fuel, there is no yacht, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely agree, hundred percent. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your comments, your time, and your insight. I think the future, uh, obviously, from my point of view, is driving this sustainability topic. 
uh, Jan Willem, you said this comment about engineers and crew, etc. I, I really feel there is a conservatism there because they've been trained to do diesel maintenance. Uh, and I feel that's there's going to be a, almost a vacuum in the system of people who know how to look after the next generation of technology. So that's another thing we have to tackle. Uh, I agree with all of you about the, the future client base wanting something that's far more acceptable. You look at the arrival of Tesla, you look at the arrival of everything else in the automotive and the talk about the new electric planes. The world is changing very fast, but I feel the yacht market is changing um, not as fast as we probably should. So I agree with you, <laughs> Tobias. One of the things we will definitely do is make sure more of these conversations happen. And I'm really looking forward to more of them with, with shipyards on the call, with engineers on the call, and maybe with owners on the call, because I think that would be an interesting debate. So thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. <laughs>